Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me to to this forum. I, um, yeah, first some words. Why why am I here? What could I possibly have to tell you? Um, I guess uh, I'm here because I've been advocating for political measures to stop climate change and to uh, protect the environment since the end of the 80s. So I've been sort of into these issues for a bit more than 30 years, uh, 40 soon. <laughs> uh, well, anyway. I um, uh, used to be a parliamentarian. I used to be a member of the Swedish parliament uh, representing the Green Party. And I was also the spokesperson, which is like president or chairperson of the Swedish Green Party for, for nine years, uh, from 2002 to 2011. And during that period of time, we also cooperated very closely with the Social Democrats and had quite a lot of influence on Swedish policymaking. And uh, we were also in opposition at times, um, we had a support from, from the public between uh, four and uh, 10%, more or less. And uh, um, yeah, we, we had more influence on politics than our actual uh, political support. But I want to talk a little bit about attitudes towards uh, policymaking as a tool to stop climate change, mainly, and uh, a bit about what kind of measures I think are important to to get somewhere. And we hear, my, <laughs> I was thinking, what title should I put on this uh, speech? But I, I think that what we are hearing right now is a lot of you know, young people shouting that, why is nothing happening? Come on, it's urgent. Come on now, do something. Do th something about climate change. And uh, I think that's, that's quite interesting uh, because their notion is that nothing is happening. While in my opinion, having seen the development for the last 30, 35 years, I think a lot more is happening than ever before. So let's take a look uh, on the one hand and the other. What is actually the situation right now? Is something happening or is nothing happening? Who, who is wrong and who is right? And I think that both are, are right in a way. You can see here is the EU 27 emissions since 1990. And this is the decrease uh, in uh, CO2 equivalent uh, kilotons. And you can see that, yes, the emissions have decreased since 1990. Something has happened. Uh, you can also see on a global level that uh, not so much has happened. Uh, the increase of emissions is not that huge anymore. Uh, but at least uh, we do not decrease them in uh, the uh, at the rate that we should. So we can see that that uh, we are very, very far from where we need to be if we are supposed to reach the 1.5 Celsius degree uh, trajectory. So the, the um, we can say that possibly the yellow line or the blue line is where we might be today. Uh, with the COP26, maybe the blue line could lean a little bit downwards uh, but where we need to be is the gray line at the bottom if we want to, to stop uh, climate change uh, from uh, uh, exceeding 1.5 degrees Celsius. So in that sense, nothing is happening, or at least not enough is happening. And if we then look at uh, the things that actually have happened, uh, how did they happen? Why do things happen? And why do they not happen sometimes? Oh, sorry, I think I went to step. Uh, so um, changes, how do, they, how do they come about? And I, my, my simple answer to that is someone starts doing something. And I will show you a few examples of what is starting to do something. Uh, one uh, example here is wind power. We see a situation right now, wind power is economically competitive with other energy sources if you are to invest in new production. And you can see wind power growing all over the world, more or less in Sweden. Uh, we have reached somewhere around between 15 and 20% of the electricity production is from wind power. Denmark is getting close to 50%. And uh, of course, uh, it's vulnerable in the way that the wind is not blowing all the time and you need backups and those kinds of things. But still, wind power is 
competitive. And how did that happen? Well, uh, already 30 years ago, there were wind power plants. Some pioneers built them, tested them. They concluded that they do produce electricity. You can use that electricity uh, for, for different purposes. And uh, sort of the innovation phase at that time was, it wasn't over, but there, there were wind power plants already 30 years ago. Then we had about 25 years of political debate or even long before 30 years ago, we had the political debate about wind power, whether we should invest in it or not. And um, what happened was of course that uh, the technology uh, became better and then politicians created an artificial market for renewable energy. One of the leading actors on this was Germany. Uh, you can have a lot of opinions on the way they decided to do this. It was somewhat expensive for, for the households, uh, but they created an artificial market by promising a certain price for electricity produced by wind power. Sweden created another type of artificial market by, by uh, setting more or less quotas that should be uh, fulfilled for re by renewable energy and it was also paid over the electricity bill somehow in the end, as, as it always is, so to say. And uh, uh, through those artificial markets, uh, we got a lot of investments in wind power. We got a lot of production of wind power plants, technologies developed. With time, we became better and better at including wind power in the power system and uh, price decreased. And now we have a situation where wind power is competitive by itself. I would say that the political measures in this case have been crucial to create uh, a situation as it is now. It might have happened sooner or later, but it would probably have been maybe 10 years or 15 years from now. So it would have been a lot delayed without political measures. Another example, uh, uh, are electric vehicles. You can see that electric vehicles are very close to being competitive compared to combustion engine vehicles, at least for private transport, you know, private cars or yeah, cars in general. Uh, and how did that happen? Did it, was it just, you know, technological development and uh, this uh, fantastic innovator who sold this? No, it wasn't really. Uh, of course, we had the battery technology already from the beginning. There have been trials with electric vehicles going back many, many decades, but there has never been like a, a production site really for electric vehicles, but there was an investment in production site. It was Tesla who was the, the sort of starting point here. They created a high-end market for electric vehicles, uh, meaning that it was only for the really, really uh, wealthy people or for companies to buy those vehicles. And when the vehicles were out on the market, some countries decided to give political incentives to create a larger market for electric vehicles. One of the leading ones were Norway. Uh, they had already a high taxation on vehicles in general. And if you bought an electric vehicle, you wouldn't have to pay that tax. So then they became uh, comparably cheap uh, com if you compared them to, to like, uh, Volvo or, or something, or BMW or, or, or those combustion engine vehicles. They also had a lot of other political incentives. You got the free parking, you didn't have to pay car toll when you went into Oslo and, and uh, other things like that. You could go on the ferry for free and so on. So uh, these political incentives made Norway at one point the largest market in the world for electric vehicles. And um, I think it still is the country with most Teslas per capita and uh, California had political incentives to promote electric vehicles as well, uh, which led to more research and innovation, price decreased for batteries, and uh, then you got more political incentives in more countries and a lot of political discussion whether electric vehicles are really better than other vehicles, which I would say uh, there is really no doubt that they are uh, better even though they are not perfect. And then you got a larger production, lower prices, blah, blah, blah. The COVID crisis helped by decreasing the sales of vehicles in general, which made a lot of car producers decrease production, especially of the combustion engine uh, vehicles and 
still investing in the electric vehicles. This picture shows BTS, which is a K-pop group that I like a lot, uh, and they done this commercial, I don't think they actually had a lot of role to play in making uh, electric vehicles competitive, but it made it more fun. So I kept them here anyway. And now you can say that the electric vehicles are competitive or at least very near to being competitive compared to combustion engines. It would have happened maybe uh, without political incentives, but probably much, much later. So this is a, a combination of you know, investments from private actors, uh, the research and development, and political measures to make create this market. So, uh, the obstacles then, why do things not always happen? Yeah, there are a lot of excuses why uh, these political uh, measures are not sort of being decided upon. There's a skepticism generally uh, towards political incentives that sort of um, disturb uh, businesses. Uh, things will sort themselves out. You can hear that a lot. Someone is dreaming about the silver bullet technology, blaming someone else who is worse than you, and it doesn't matter what we do, uh, or waiting for everyone else to act. Another example is uh, the carbon tax on heating oil we introduced in Sweden in, I think it was 2005. Before it was introduced, we got this debate that uh, all the elderly people will die from cold because it would be too expensive to heat their houses. No one would be able to live in the north of Sweden. It would be too expensive for people in the countryside. There are no alternatives. That's why they would freeze to death. Uh, and then after it was introduced, you got the decreased use of heating oil by two thirds in three years. It was a transition to heat pumps, wood pellets, district heating. No elderly people died from cold, and the north of Sweden is doing better than ever. Mm -hmm. So there is a very strong skepticism toward political incentives, but when you actually introduce them, they usually work quite well, especially taxation, I would say. We had also the example of the congestion charges in Stockholm. It's a car toll system where people, in, before they were introduced, had the notion that they, no one would drive less. Some people said no one would afford to drive anymore at all. So it doesn't really, uh, it wasn't the same person saying both things, but both arguments were heard in the discussion. And also a lot of people opposed the implementation of congestion charges, but when they were introduced, we got less congestion, not very surprising, and better flow of traffic, and you could steer the traffic over the day much better. People who use bicycle, public transport more, and then we had actually a referendum where 60% voted in favor of congestion charges. It wasn't as dangerous as they thought. Um, now we have this issue, won't tech solve everything? And I think that we can have, a, I, I'm quite a tech enthusiast in many ways, but I can also see that there are a lot of market barriers to sort of go from one sort of technology to another. Uh, and those market barriers might not be possible for just one actor to solve by themselves. So you might need actually political incentives and political measures to uh, get this mark across those market bar barriers. And uh, it's also difficult to be competitive immediately with a new technology. So you might need some time and during that time you might need support in some way to actually get where you want to be in five or 10 years time. Uh, it's insecure investments when you don't actually really know how competitive it will be. There are always some technological challenges and the debate on which solution is the best one might also be an obstacle for, for tech to, to solve everything. Uh, here is an example of the uh, sort of obstacle that companies think they are good enough already so they don't think they need any political measures to pressure them harder because they compare themselves to someone else who is worse. And you can always find someone else who is worse at something. This is the steel industry, different aspects of, of arguments that they use within the steel industry to sort of say that we are the best, the most sustainable uh, of all within our industry. And uh, they never compare themselves really to what does the climate actually need us to do, but they compare themselves to someone else within their own sector. But this goes for countries as well. Sweden might say that uh, we, are, we are better than China, 
uh, so we don't actually need to do anything more because someone else is worse and why should we do something? So where does policy making come in here? I would say that without political measures, we subsidize polluters because pollution costs. And if the polluter does not pay, someone else will pay. That's a subsidy. And that's actually defined as a subsidy by the OECD. So if you don't have a carbon tax or taxation on pollu pollution, uh, whatever pollution it is, you actually subsidize the industry. And then we shouldn't discuss really taxation. We should discuss why should this industry be subsidized by everyone else. And those who subsidize it the most are the ones who get the highest cost for climate change, which means people in uh, the South Pacific, for example, living on islands just one meter above sea level, who will actually be more or less drowned if we get climate change of three, four degrees. Uh, and uh, we are the ones to sort of gain from this in the rich countries who used fossil fuels for, to sort of, you know, make our economies run. And uh, as long as the polluters does not pay, everyone will pay, and that's a subsidy. And also the markets are distorted for the same reason. If you don't pay the actual cost of fossil fuels, then the market is distorted. So it will be very difficult for someone else to compete if these industries are actually subsidized. And that means we also risk being stuck with old technologies because there are these market barriers, the markets are distorted, we are subsidizing fossil fuels, they don't pay their costs and so on. And that means we will get stuck with old technologies. And we don't want that because we want to be you know, technologically advanced and we want the new technologies to actually be introduced also when it comes to transport and energy and industrial production and so on. It means also that you would put all the pressure on the individuals or leave it up to the industry to change by themselves. And I don't think that's a good solution either. Also, the, the political measures are needed because there are also, if you do not decide to act upon climate change, you will act upon something. Business as usual is also a decision. So you do a lot of public investments in different kinds of things. And if you choose to just continue business as usual, you will not stop climate change and the necessary investments will not actually happen, and the transition will be too slow. So what you need to do is you need to create incentives and markets for these technologies and these solutions that are needed to stop climate change. So the first one is to stop subsidies to fossil fuels. And uh, there are direct subsidies that you actually give investment support for building coal plants and such things, or you uh, set a fixed price for gas or something, which means that you actually subsidize fossil fuels directly, but you also have the indirect subsidy of them not paying the actual price for the pollution. So correct pricing through either carbon taxation or different kinds of trading schemes like the ETS is necessary to give the right incentives and create the market for the more less polluting alternatives and those technologies that we want to promote. You can also use regulatory instruments that's being used a lot when it comes to emission standards for cars and, and heavy duty vehicles, for example, that you actually set a limit how much a vehicle is allowed to emit. And those regulatory instruments, they also push uh, the uh, industry to become more efficient and to uh, sell more of those things that are the best ones in the market. And it will also possibly, of course, hurt some industries who will not adapt, but I think that's more or less their own fault that they didn't adapt. You can set different kinds of quotas. That's what you've been doing for renewable energy in Sweden, for example, that you set quotas, you need to uh, introduce this much of renewable energy when you sell electricity in the market. It could also be used for recycled content in products, for example. Then you can restrict the use of the most polluting technologies. Why should someone be allowed to actually destroy the environment if there are other 
you know, competitive technologies that could actually be used instead. Uh, I think that freedom of, of um, for business is very important, but there are some technologies that are the most polluting ones that could actually restrict the use of. And then you can use the instrument of public procurement, which is quite efficient as well. You can create a market by buying the more efficient and less polluting types of products in public procurement. You can support investments in different ways. I've listed a few things that support investments. Uh, I think the fifth one here is quite interesting. There are a lot of regulatory barriers in the market, um, which uh, makes it difficult to introduce new solutions sometimes because the market has been created and the regulatory environment is created for certain types of technologies and the new ones might not actually be uh, allowed to compete, like selling secondary raw materials, for example, uh, might not be allowed because they are derived from waste and that's, that's not allowed to use as a resource in the market. And uh, you would also want to have some kind of incentives to create resource efficient societies and there are a few crucial measures to be taken when it comes to that, uh, incre increased product life and reusability and recyclability. We set a lot of regulations how products much must be to be allowed to be sold in the European single market. And of course, we could also set rules for uh, product lifespan and reusability and recyclability of products. So uh, that's, I think, something that would be also very good for the individuals that we could set those kind of demands. Is there a silver bullet technology which will solve it all? Here are a few of those that are on the table being discussed right now. Hydrogen is super popular as, as sort of a dream silver bullet technology. I think right now the amount of renewable hydrogen in the market is somewhere between a half and one percent or something like that, which means that almost all hydrogen is actually produced from fossil fuels today. So we need, if we are supposed to use hydrogen technology to um, run industry, for example, then we would need to increase the production of, of renewable hydrogen a lot. Uh, CCS CCU is, is carbon capture and storage of carbon capture and usage, where you would actually capture the CO2 emissions from uh, preferably a biomass plant where you burn biomass to produce energy and then you would catch the carbon and then you could actually store it on the ground or you can use it. That's something that, that uh, uh, everyone says we will need somehow. How much and exactly how many, uh, how much investment support you would give, that's a discussion, but I think it's crucial technology anyway. Uh, electrification of industrial processes is something that's also a very popular solution that would need a lot of renewable electricity though not to you know, increase the production of electricity from natural gas or coal. Bioeconomy was super popular 10 years ago, a little bit more skeptic discussion today. I still believe that the bioeconomy has a lot to give, even though it might not be a silver bullet technology. It's still a lot of things we do from fossil fuels today where we could use biomass, renewable and sustainable biomass. Uh, some people are still believe in the fourth generation nuclear as the silver bullet technology. I might be a little bit more skeptical because I've heard this discussion for so long and still not so much is actually uh, happening when it comes to making it into reality. So uh, conclusion, things are actually happening. They are not happening fast enough. And uh, we can see that actually other countries are doing quite lots, things are happening all around the world. We cannot say that, you know, why should we do something when no one else is blah, 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 because uh, more or less all countries in the world with a few exceptions are on board today in tackling climate change in some way. And also, of course, in Europe, we have a huge responsibility to act because we are better economically off than in many other places in the world, but we also are responsible for a lot of historical emissions. So uh, we can't wait for Master Yoda to come and save us, but we must actually do it ourselves. 
and uh, a lot of political measures would help speed up the transition. Thanks. Thank you, Maria. Well, I would like to have Master Yoda come and help us. Yes, I, I think it would be super useful actually as well. Do you know one? <laughs> I actually know that he doesn't care. He thinks it's our own responsibility. Uh, plumber. All right, we have some questions for you as well. And then thank you for, for this presentation. I think it was uh, both brave, but also highly educating. Um, and um, on the other hand, also a bit scary, because when you look at all of those facts, then um, I tend to start uh, having the same attitude as you said in the beginning that the youth has, that you know nothing's happening. Um, mm. But the rational part in me is trying to also kind of argue that you know there are measures and people are meeting and they're doing something but then you know but anyway um, so uh, there is one question uh, from uh, uh, somebody watching us that I would like to address you with uh, so who should be responsible for the rollout of charging stations for electric vehicles private mm -hmm. enterprise or the state where can these sectors compromise what do you think mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, with the increasing demand for electric vehicles, I would believe that a lot of the investments can actually be made and be made profitable by, by private actors, but they might not anyway happen fast enough, which means that uh, I used to have supported that a country like Sweden actually give some state support for investing in charging stations, and it has speeded up investments a lot, only that they get that maybe 25% of the investment paid by by state uh, investment fund. So uh, probably some kind of combination is needed to get it to happen fast enough. Otherwise, you would have to, you know, demand from someone that they make these investments. And who would you demand it from? Would it be the power companies or would it be those who own the gas stations today or anyone establishing a parking space. I mean, there are some alternatives already also to do it like that, but it's a little bit more tricky. You also mentioned uh, in, your, in your keynote the uh, hydrogen and uh, how this could be something for the future, but yet it's still produced with fossils. Then uh, when we talk about the energy uh, and, and uh, demanding uh, need to consume it then uh, do you think what do you think of nuclear because there is actually a kind of a debate also in Estonia around it and and there are some some companies who are trying to build it for the future so what what is uh, your opinion on there I am a bit you know um, conservative green when it comes to nuclear so I'm still opposing nuclear power and mainly today, I would say, because it is expensive, it takes a lot of time to build nuclear power plants. And we still haven't really solved the issue of the nuclear waste, which needs to be kept apart from any kind of life for 100,000 years. And wouldn't you, in that case, rather invest in solutions that are a bit faster and a bit cheaper? While Finland built this uh, Olkiluoto-Kolme nuclear power plant, Sweden built 20 terawatt hours of wind power, which has actually produced electricity for years now, while the Finnish nuclear power plant still hasn't produced even one terawatt hour. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, another question, um, and I also uh, again wake up to the wake up call to the audience. You can ask questions from Maria as well. Uh, while there is anything, nothing new coming, then I will I, I will ask it. But um, um, I would just like to s hear your approach on how do you persuade uh, or argue with the leaders or CEOs of the companies who are in the fossils or, or they produce and they, they use a lot of fossils to actually take responsibility, to, um, to accept responsibility and to invest into sustainability. Because this is ongoing debate 
and and there are still lots of companies and even states who think that it's possible to continue as it has been so far. So how do you argue with them? I think actually that one of the most useful arguments is the threat of political measures. <laughs> Um, and um, because if you, if you get them to believe that if they don't act, uh, it will cost them a lot in the future because there will be political measures that will force them in a certain direction. And the sooner they move, uh, the less difficult it will be. I think that's a good argument. But then, of course, all business people are humans. They are affected by the debate around the COP26 as well. So to, to get some kind of, you know, pressure here through what the youth are driving and the activists and all these discussions might also work. And in Sweden we had a, you know I talk a lot about Sweden because that's because I'm Swedish, we invited, uh, the politicians invited all different business sectors, industry sectors to make their own roadmaps for how to reach carbon neutrality by 2045. So they actually uh, they they uh, made these reports where they said that, yes, we can do this, but then we need this, that, and that from the politicians, the investment support and the research and innovation and this and that. So uh, then we can do this. And then the politicians will actually be the ones who will have the responsibility to act upon what the business asks for. So do you think uh, it's actually interesting, uh, interesting angle that... Uh, uh, when we talk about uh, business sphere, then the solution could be that before you start comparing yourself next to other countries or or or, or other parts of the world, you should first look at uh, the sectoral situation within your own country, meaning that the transportation sector should have their own understanding how they are influencing, what's their impact, the energy sector, and and so on, so on, and then. From there, we can kind of bring out the, the mutual understanding of what do we actually need in order to reach mm -hmm. those changes. I mean, if, you, if we have an overall target, everyone agrees we should be climate neutral by 2050 in the EU, not everyone agrees, but I mean, most people agree, then of course, every sector must themselves look at how can we uh, achieve this target? And what do we need? What can we do now? What can we do later? And to do that, what do we need? And uh, I think if you don't have any idea, why would someone want to invest in your company if you have no idea how to tackle the future of becoming climate neutral by 2050? At least me, I would be very hesitant to invest in such a company. Okay, uh, last question from me is that um, currently uh, we're in the era where, uh, not in the era, I mean, it's past few months basically where energy prices have gone up like really high i mean i tanked my car last week and i'm not going to tell you what the bill <laughs> invoice was I, I surely didn't like it uh, so what is what what do you think if if this continues and also to move towards more on renewables and more sustainable energy sources it's probably means that this is not the moment that the prices are high. This is what the future will be like. We need to pay for it. So how the markets will respond to it and, and how we regular average citizens actually face it because it also means that we all, we need to change the way we behave, the way we, we consume. But until there is a cheap option and expensive option, most people nevertheless will choose the cheap one. So, uh, and, and I look for, uh, from Estonian perspective, I look towards Sweden and I think that you all in Sweden, you are very sustainable and very responsible people. Uh, mm, are, sure. are you, are you, and, and are you, uh, or how's, how has the change really happened there in your country? Well, uh, I mean, Sw Sweden has done a lot and taken a lot of political measures, but if you look at resource use, for example, we are much worse villains than Estonia. We use much more resources per capita, so we are responsible for a larger ecological footprint in the world, even though some of those emissions are produced in China, somewhere else. So I would say that we shouldn't, you know, boast too much about ourselves either. We still have a long way to go. Uh, so um, politics, well, Still a lot to be done also there. 
but yes, um, I think uh, Estonia should, of course, do more as well, but don't think that Sweden is perfect, because we are definitely not. And the, I mean, uh, I would really love Sweden to, to do a lot of more things, and I, I've been promoting a lot of political measures that have not been introduced as well. So. But the thing is that what I mentioned already before is the fact that, I mean, we have forced through some of these environmental taxes from a position of being a small party of five, between five and 10% in the parliament. We have forced through these political measures. And when we lost power in 2010, uh, they could have been removed, but they weren't. So they are still there, meaning that everyone accepted them after they were introduced, even though the industry organizations, for example, they opposed everything. They opposed every environmental regulation and law and every environmental tax. But after they were introduced, they accepted them. I think that's quite interesting to remember. So it might be super controversial at first, but afterwards, not so much. Thanks. Uh, there's a few more questions from the audience. So, current coalition talks in Germany are at risk of falling apart due to Greens' demands. Do environmentalists ask too much, or are other parties too convenient? <laughs> oh, that's a very difficult question. How to balance between you know demanding actual uh, political change and uh, doing it so hard that you lose power. <laughs> That's the, you know, always the green dilemma. Where is the limit where you can't actually be in that government because the lack of ambition on green issues, when being in the government is the only way to actually influence right now. But if you are outside the government and in opposition, you can criticize and then you get a stronger position in the next election, maybe. So I can't really say for, for Germany, uh, it's up to them to decide how hard they should go. While talking about being in power after the next elections, then when we think of the climate crisis, then this could also be that the next election will be too late. So there mm. is like the question of, do you compromise now in order at least to influence the change with small steps is, is, is always there. And, and uh, I think it needs to be asked. But you need uh, to know your own position also. Are you in the position that you can actually demand more and still get it through and be in the government? Yeah. Of course, then you should do it. Yeah, okay. There's one more quite specific question. We have uh, three minutes, so I'll, I'll take that one as well. How much you see that battery industry influencing our environment regarding to lithium isn't so safe for all the solution in energy field? Mm. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of things to, that needs to be done for the battery industry to be sustainable, uh, especially the recycling of the components and the, and the materials in batteries and the, the lifespan and how you use that in the optimal way. So they are not sustainable at all, but it's still better to use electric vehicles than to use combustion engine vehicles for the, I would say for the, the main reason being that electric motors are much more efficient. So you, while you do, now today in, in Sweden, I think we use like, I think it's 90 terawatt hours for, for transport fuels. If you would go over to electric vehicles, maybe that would be 50, 10 or 15. So it's much more efficient. So you need much less resources to produce the amount of uh, right kind of energy to drive. Okay, final question. This comes from me. So, um, scary one. <laughs> uh, when we, we listen to the scientists and we look at the facts and, and the same data you showed us before, then it kind of, from the regional perspective, uh, it kind of all makes sense. These are the facts we need to act. But at the same time, there are still lots of people also entrepreneurs who say that, uh, no, 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 these um, regulations or restrictions you're creating, that uh, there's no point. We need to do it differently, yet nobody knows how to do differently. So my mm -hmm. question is that, is there actually a chance, what do you think, is there a chance that 
somebody is wrong and we could actually continue, for example, in Estonia with oil shale, because currently the government has said that this should be stopped by 2035 and, and finally uh, for 2040. But um, is there a chance that maybe there will be a solution that will allow us to continue? Uh, it might be, but it would be super expensive, so it wouldn't be competitive. I mean, uh, there is the carbon capture and storage technology. It's not large enough today. And if you would use that on all fossil fuel plants, and you would actually manage to store the carbon underground in a safe way where it would never be emitted again, I mean, that could be technologically a solution, but it would be super expensive. And that would make it a very bad idea to even uh, try, I would say. And what I'm afraid of is that a lot of governments and companies use the dream of these technologies as an excuse to continue business as usual for years and years and years uh, while waiting for it to be implemented. So I would say, in reality, no. I think we, the, the thing that needs to be done is to stop extracting fossil fuels and start investing in the alternatives. Thank you. That's a pretty strong ending. And uh, I will take that with me uh, when after 15 minutes we will start discussing with uh, several entrepreneurs from the field uh, mm. uh, about it. Thank you I very much. Also the, the risk of stranded assets. I mean, if you invest a lot in things that will actually not be competitive in 10 or 15 years, that's a huge economical risk. Sorry. Thank you. Well, well, don't say sorry. This is your point of view. Thank you. And we'll, we'll be, we will be back in.